Welcome to the awards program for the 15th annual Celebrate the Arts Writing Contest. My name is Stephen Grinch, and I'm proud to be a part of this video event to showcase and announce this year's winners. The contest is sponsored by the Arts Council of Westerville, the Westerville Public Library, and this week, Westerville News and Public Opinion Newspaper, in order to recognize and encourage the talents of writers of all ages, especially now during April, which is Arts Month in Westerville. We want to thank and acknowledge the work of our judges. Dr. Terry Hermson, published poet and English and creative writing professor at Otterbein University, go cards, and Cheryl Ortlieb, retired teacher in Westerville City Schools, who taught fourth, fifth, and sixth grades for 30 years. This year, they judged 103 entries. We also want to thank our video technician, Dennis Blair, for all of his work on this presentation. Now, winners, here is a brief word about the prizes. You'll receive in the mail a copy of the book containing all entries into the contest, courtesy of the Friends of the Westerville Public Library, your award certificate, and a copy of the judge's comments on your writing. Also, first place winners will see their work and picture printed in This Week Westerville News. Plus, all award winners' works and pictures will appear in their online publication. Now, let's see each presentation by our winners according to their grade or age category and find out each person's award. We want to let you know that in many cases, due to the length of the writings, the writers were asked to select excerpts from their works for us to enjoy. We will begin with the videos of the four winning writers in the category for the grades kindergarten through second grade. Then we will see the four winners for grades third through fifth, then grades six through eight, and grades nine through 12, until finally we get to the adults aged 18 and up. As you view each video, you will see the presenter's name, the title of their work, and the award the writers received from the judge. So without further ado, here we go. My name is Logan, and my poem is called My Gecko. My Gecko, bumpy and tiny, spotted and colorful. He likes to hide from me. He is so ridiculous. Chicken sandwiches, but chicken sandwiches don't always love Cooper back. Why? Because they want to stay fresh and do not want to be eaten. What do chicken sandwiches do to avoid being eaten? Sometimes when Ben Cooper tries to take a bite quickly, they quickly slip out of his hand. Sometimes they make a little sandwich while the chicken hides somewhere else. Most of the time, they tell Cooper's brain that they are super young to convince his mama to buy more and more and more. When this happens, Cooper's tummy gets full and and starts to hurt. Those are all the reasons why Cooper's chicken sandwiches wins. For Cooper to be the chicken sandwich, he knows what to do. He has to hold up until it's tight. Then he checks for lettuce, and if it is there, he will pull it out. Then he would find the chicken and put it in the bun. Finally, he would eat the, chick the chicken sandwich and then eat more and more and more until his t 
coming in his school. Uh oh, the chicken sandwich strikes again. My name is Lucy Walk. My story was Lucy and Asher's adventure. One day, Lucy and Asher went to the park. They see a map. They open it. Treasure map! Lucy and Asher read the map. It says to go left. Then they find a pirate ship. Next, they go inside the pirate ship. Lucy and Asher explore inside. And all of a sudden, the ship starts to move. Ah! A day at the park has turned into a voyage on the water. Then they see a jungle. They look back on the treasure map and see they should go for him. Then they see a person walking in the jungle who asks, Who are you? Asher and Lucy introduce themselves. The stranger's name is Josiah. He asks, What are you two doing in the jungle? This place is very dangerous. The only reason I'm in here is I got lost. Asher and Lucy explain they found a treasure map in the park. Is there any treasure in, the, in this jungle? Lucy asked. Josiah replies, I found a map too. Do you want to help me find the treasure? Lucy Asher replied, Yeah! All three of them were off to find the treasure. They see a big hole. It wasn't just a hole. It was a ravine. Lucy and Asher knew that it was there where they were supposed to go. But Josiah wondered how could they get across. They see a nearby plane. Lucy said, does anyone know how to fly a plane? Josiah says he can. All three loaded on the plane. Josiah flew them over the ravine. And below they saw the treasure at last. Josiah flies Asher and Lucy home. They thought they would play on the playground today. Instead, they had an adventure in discovering treasure. Hello, I'm Abby Chai. I wrote this essay to remember how I lost my first tooth and I'm going to share part of it with you. This is the $10 that two fairy gave me. Losing my first tooth. I was wondering when I would lose my first tooth. One night, I was biting a piece of tough pork. I felt the pork move my lower front tooth a little bit. I dashed off to the bathroom. I looked into the mirror and wiggled my tooth. My tooth started to lose. I was so excited! However, it was not time to pull out. Mom suggests to wiggle my tooth more. About three weeks later, I decided to pull out my loose tooth. It was super loose and my adult tooth was growing inward. Because of the pandemic, we tried to pull it out by ourselves instead. Before pulling out the tooth, Mom and I watched a YouTube video about how to pull out a tooth. First, I brushed my teeth and took my favorite stuffed animal, Marshall, with me. Mom prepared a string, some cotton balls, and ice cubes. Second, I sucked three ice cubes, one at a time, to numb my tooth. Meanwhile, Mom made a slide loop with a string. After my tooth was numb, Mom wrapped the loop around my tooth. We agreed when Mom counted 20, she would pull it out. I felt nervous and held Marshall tightly. Surprisingly, Mom pulled out my tooth earlier than 20. I didn't feel hurt, but a little funny after that. Mom put a cotton ball on that spot and asked me to bite down. Also, I was allowed to watch my favorite TV show to make me feel better. I was so excited to see my tooth and couldn't wait to put it under my pillow. I was told the tooth fairy would come and give you a coin to exchange your tooth when you were sleeping. I went to bed and immediately 
The next morning, under my pillow, there were ten dollars. I can't wait to lose another tooth. My name is Annalise Grant, and I'm doing a diamante poem. A diamante poem. Girl, pretty, kind. Flowers, dresses, dolls. Makeup, fashion, pants, cars. Sports, joking, action. Handsome, strong, boy. My name is Madeline Tracy, and my, the name of my story is Little Fires Rising. Do all water dragons do that now? Egon asked. Ocean and Aqua looked at him. Egon wanted to call Blaze, but he was already hurtling down towards them. Everyone moved, and Blaze fell into the water. Blaze shrieked. He hurried to land because he hated water. The others giggled. When Blaze finally got out of the water, he glared at them. Immediately, they stopped laughing. The sound of a fish flopping caught everyone's attention. Their eyes fell on Blaze's tail. A fish was stuck on the tip of his tail. Egon swung his tail around, grabbed the fish, and ate it. Blaze stared. What? The fish was yummy, Egon said while chewing. Ocean spoke. I'm glad you're all here. We have discovered someone is trying to steal the treasure we have sworn to protect. We should go check on it, Aqua said. Egon, you stay here, Blaze said. Wait, why? Egon asked, upset. Aqua looked at him, spit out a way of a water, and shook her head. Egon knew what she was talking about. He could not spit fire like either dragons. At best, he could light a small campfire. He wasn't sure why, but he was determined to find out. Egon was sad he couldn't go, but it gave him more time to read his scrolls. He hoped the scroll would reveal to him how to spit fire, but they didn't. An hour later, he saw his friends in the distance. Guys, what are you doing back here? he asked. Aqua, as they arrived at the cliff bottom, we came back for you, Blaze said as he came up to hug Egon. Egon pushed him away. We want to help you get your fire back, Ocean said joyfully. He could not believe it. Was he going to get his fire? He hoped. He gulped and looked at them. I'm ready, he said. They flew to the elemental center where dragons learned to use their powers. When they walked in, they saw four banners hanging over four different doors. Red for fire, blue for water, green for earth, and white with hints of light blue for wind and air. Egon made his way to the door labeled fire. The others waited. When he entered, Egon saw so many scrolls. Another dragon was e reading one. Egon walked up to him and looked at him. Abby's Tropical Adventure by Lydia Purdy. One dreary November day, a girl named Addie was in her room reading a book. Soon, suddenly, she heard a high-pitched voice. Addie, come, follow me. Addie assumed it was just one of her brothers trying to bother her. But she, but she checked anyways. No one was outside her door. She looked inside her closet. Strangely, her clothes weren't there. Instead, she saw a tropical rainforest, and in front of her was a fairy. Hi, I'm Hallie, a hibiscus fairy, she said. Wow, what are you doing here? asked Ad Addie. I'm here to take you on an adventure, Hallie explained. Really? Okay, ex exclaimed Addie. Well, what are you waiting for? Let's go, said Hallie. Hallie led Addie down a path when they came to a waterfall. Hallie said, this is a magic waterfall. Don't worry, it's fun. Hallie grabbed a raft made out of logs and moss and sprinkled fairy dust on it so it grew bigger and Addie could ride on it. Addie and Hallie strapped on seat belts that were made of bendy pieces of grass. Addie got jitters. What if they drowned? As if Hallie could read her mind, she said, Don't worry. We fairies always take human girls on adventures here, and each one of them has survived, and you won't even get wet. Addie felt better. Addie started to paddle with a lawn stick. Addie held her breath as the waterfall took them away. Hallie waved her fairy wand, and a big bubble surrounded the raft. When they went down, the raft kept a steady pace. Addie took that time to look around. She saw fairies and humans frolicking together in the woods. It looked like a lot of fun. When they got to the end of the waterfall, Hallie said, Come, it's time for the party. Day turned to night, and then Allie re realized something. 
Hallie, my family is probably worrying about me. I've been gone for so long, she said. Addie, have you ever read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Hallie asked. Well, yes, but what does that have to do with anything? Addie asked. It's the time. No time has passed in your world, ha Hallie explained. But the, you're right, you should, probably get, you should probably be getting home soon. I'll lead the way. Hallie led Addie back to a tree at the edge of the forest. She waved her family fairy wand, and Addie's closet appeared. Thank you so much. I had a lot of fun, said Addie. Can you take me on an adventure another time, she asked. Sure, and with that, Hallie disappeared. Well, thought Addie. As she closed the closet door and turned around, she noticed a hibiscus flower on the pillow. So cool. The end. I'm Lucy Elliott, and the name of my story is Horseshoe. Lauren, stop. Remember what Mom said about jumping off the loft into a pile of hay? You'll get hurt, Kylie called. Besides, we're supposed to be mucking out the barn, not breaking our necks. It's not that high, responded Warren. Kylie retorted, do, you do I have to come up here there and tickle you to death before you'll agree to stop your wacko jumping stunts that land you in the hospital and Mom and Dad in the middle of a financial crisis? If you don't want me to jump, yes, Warren said matter-of-factly. Fine, Kylie answered as she climbed up the ladder to the hayloft. When she reached the top, Kylie grabbed her brother's shirt sleeve and marched him to the corner of the loft where she tackled him to the floor. Ouch, he cried. My head hit something metal. Huh? There, he said, pointing toward a glint beneath the hay. I think it's a box. Open it, Kylie commanded when her brother had cleared away the hay, revealing a rectangular metal box. Inside, they discovered a leather book with a horseshoe print on its cover and the name Lillian Grace in gold lettering. I think it's a journal, Warren said, dumbfounded. dumbfounded. Inscribed on the front page was Diary of Elizabeth Lillian Grace. Warren turned the page to the first entry. It read, Dear Diary, I have just bought this journal and had inscribed on its front color Lillian cover Lillian Grace. I chose my middle and last names as I think that Elizabeth is so old-fashioned. It's hard to believe that a whole year has passed since we moved to Horseshoe Ranch. Bleh, ranch. I believe by next year in 1970, I will be accustomed to my new life. But for now, I will still miss Colorado. Mother is calling me, but I will write again tomorrow. Kylie grabbed the journal from Lauren and found the next entry. Dear Diary, I've heard the most incredible news. Men have walked on the moon. It's revolutionary. And two great things in one day. I'll explain about the second. Mama is pregnant. A boy, she says. His name will be Michael, which means warrior. Kylie turned to the next page. Empty. A piece of frayed paper fell out. What do you think she meant by the note holds the key, he at she asked. I don't know, Warren answered. They heard a clink as something shiny hit the floor. Warren and Kylie exchanged a glance. They'd seen a lock with that design before. Snatching the key off the ground, they raced back to the house. Stomping their boots on the mat, they ran into the they ran into Kylie's room. There was a locked window seat that opened up, presumably into a storage compartment. They, she slid the key into the lock. Click! A perfect fit. Lifting the lid, li yeah. lifting the lid, Kylie grabbed a small box and opened it. Inside was a horseshoe-shaped locket with a note attached. The note read, "My grandmother Hazel Grace's locket." It contains a picture of her and my grandfather, founders of Horseshoe Ranch. Kylie opened the locket and gazed at the picture of Hazel Grace and her husband. Smiling, she placed the locket and key on top of her dresser. Realizing that he was still in her room, Kylie herded Warren out. She sat down in her bed, satisfied that she had learned the history of her home, Horseshoe Ranch. My name is Mira Shamlin, and the story I'll be reading today is called Into the Unknown. Nayeli swam gracefully and quietly through nothing. You're about 500 meters away, Nayeli, said a pleasant voice. It was her boss, Cosette, a woman with silvery hair and big eyes that were also silver. It was hard to believe that she was a trillionaire, but she had started the space exploration movement and was funding the mission. Cosette was a dreamer, and she had once told Nayeli that she was teased for dreaming when she was younger. But that is exactly what made me start this space program, she had said. 
Instead of being Cassette the Dreamer, I am now Cassette the Achiever. Nylee shook her head. Concentrate. She couldn't afford to lose focus. Not now. Okay, approaching target, Nylee reported. 200 m meters, Cassette said. Already her voice sounded quieter, which meant the gravitational pull was starting to take place. 100 meters. This time her voice was barely audible. Bye, Nylee mumbled. There was no response. Nylee breathed in and stopped right before the barrier. Cautiously, she put her hand through. The thing, which turned out to be in a round spherical shape, turned on like a light bulb and glowed a bright light. Nayeli hadn't been wearing special goggles, she would have been blinded. She pulled out her hand quickly. The orb went black, invisible in space. She can imagine Cosette saying, now, now, dear, just take your time. Then another voice sounded through her head. All you ever wanted was to prove yourself. Now is your chance. Nayeli frowned, wondering who the voice was. Maybe it was her own? Taking a deep breath, she willed herself to move her body forward. First her hand, then her leg, then half her body. Halfway in, she looked back one more time. The stars were twinkling merrily at her. Nellie stepped completely into the black hole and disappeared into the unknown. Hi, my name is Ava Amlin, and I will be reading an excerpt from my story, Scales. We trot out of the castle grounds, the fire dangerously close. The dragon's shadow soared overhead, back into the woods where it came from. Ready? I asked Rupert. As ready as I'll ever be, he mumbled. We rode off, following the dragon's silhouette. As we went further into the woods, the smoke eased up. My throat was still sore, but at least no more damage could be done. The dragon became visible again, unaware its hunters were close behind. I aimed my crossbow and shot. The modified weapon threw a large net at the beast. It screamed as it fell towards the earth. I guided Gail over to where the dragon had landed. It was rolling around, screeching in anger, trying to break free. I hopped off Gale and tiptoed to the beast. The dragon spotted me and snarled. I held up my hands and crept even closer, trying to act like I meant no harm. I reached out and touched the dragon's muzzle. As we met, a light shone so brightly I was forced to close my eyes. When I opened, I was staring at myself. My limbs felt constrained. I watched myself smirk as I drew my sword. I was about to be attacked. I screamed, but it only came out as a roar. Somehow, I had switched bodies with the dragon. My plan had suddenly taken a turn for the worse. I mustered all of my newfound strength and clawed my way out of the net. My imposter fell backward, and I advanced. The person screamed for help. Rupert jumped off Gale and rushed forward. Wait, Rupert, it's me! It's me, Annette! I yelled, but only roars came out. He pointed his sword at me. Back, you beast, he shouted. I couldn't believe what was happening. Only to make matters worse, I saw a glint of orange in the reflection of the blade. I looked to see a mob of villagers rushing over to help. They surrounded me, and I did the only thing I could think of. I blew fire. Columns of flame shot all around, one of them hitting Rupert's hand. He screamed in agony. I could not believe what I had just done. I was panicking, my new instincts continuously blowing fire. Soon every tree around me was burning, and some people had received burns as well. I was only making the situation worse. I spread my wings and shot myself into the air. I took one last glance at the pain I caused. Then I fled the only home I've ever known. I'll be reading an excerpt from my story, The Witch's Covenant. The spine-chilling wind whipped around my hood. The dead brown leaves crunched as I apprehensively crept through the dark woods. The bare trees cast shadows all over. If you dared, even just to glance at them, you would see small red eyes. I reminded myself that they were just owls, but I was desperate. I didn't even know why I was here. Why was I wandering on the path to Grandma's house? Even so, my feet continued to walk. It felt as if I was supposed to be here. I was drawn to something, but what was it? I held onto my emerald gemstone clasp. It glowed as if there was some sort of magic powering it. No, that's dumb, I thought. There is obviously a reasonable explanation for why it is glowing. My purple cloak danced wildly through the air. I took my hood back over my head. The full moon wickedly smirked as I looked up at it. Even with the moon there, no light shined about. A whisper rang in my head. Keep walking. I promise this is who you are destined to be. I jumped. Who was that? A whimper fell from my lips. Suddenly, I sprinted forward. I couldn't control my legs. Any tree or bush that blocked me, it went straight through. No cuts or trips. It felt as if air was just passing through me. Then out of the darkness emerged a small shanty cabin, Grandma's house. I stopped at the door unexpectedly. A wrinkled, hunched over elderly woman opened the door and it slowly crept open. Grandma, I wanted to scream and run away, but my body wouldn't respond to my commands. Welcome, Mary. How very fine it is happy for the ceremony. Come in, come in, she said. Her voice was soft and solemn. I didn't know whether or not to be afraid or calm. I reluctantly went inside. There before my eyes were two other older ladies. One had a navy blue robe that was tattered at the end. She had bushy white hair and one eye. A navy blue pointy hat rested on her head. A witch's hat.
It was the perfect fall day, leaves falling off the soon to be hibernating tree, squirrels collecting their last few acorns before the wicked winter storms come. A crowd of kids were gathered in a school courtyard, waiting casually for a strong rain to, also known as the bell. Every single kid was either talking to friends or kicking around a ball. This is all except for one little girl named Lainey. She was a sixth grader in the school. She had okay grades, she was okay at her sport, she was okay at the school spelling bee, and practically okay at everything. Just okay. She usually sits on the bench by herself, waiting. Well, more like hoping to hear the bell ring. She is often forgotten about, ignored, and unnoticed. This had never really bothered her before because that's all she had known her whole life. When she was a baby, she was often abandoned and left to fend for herself because her parents were busy with their jobs. When she was in preschool, she sat in a corner and listened to the teacher just like her parents told her to. She never did talk to the other children. They went, this went on all the way through elementary school. Now it's her first day in middle school and she intends on doing the same thing all the way until she's out of the education system. Suddenly, she hears the bell she's been anticipating to hear for what seems like forever. All the students proceeded to enter the school and get to the classroom marked on their schedule. Lainey looked at the paper and headed toward the classroom number 164. She walked and walked until she saw it. The classroom at the end of the hall was her first class, room 164. She walked in with her head down. She eyed down the seat in the back row. She walked faster, and just as she was about to take a seat, a boy with a bright neon shirt snatched it. Lainey looked at him and grunted. He barely noticed her and started getting his ding tag out. She looked, she took the seat one row up. A few minutes passed, and it was finally time for the teacher to start taking attendance. He called out names, some familiar from her old school, and some not. He called out her name, and in the loudest voice she could, she said, Here! The teacher still struggled to hear her because she was so quiet. Lainey noticed while the teacher was talking to another student, who was lucky enough to have gotten a seat all the way in the back row. She had a hoodie on, almost completely covering her face, and she was not listening to the teacher at all, just like Lainey wasn't. The whole class went by, and by that time, it was next period. Everyone got up, but Lainey did what she always does, and waits till the big brush gets out and walks out of the room. Weird enough, the girl in the back row did the same. She didn't move a bit. When the big brush was out, Lainey gathered her things and stood up. The girl did the same. She walked out the door right behind the mysterious girl. She looked at her paper and saw that the next class was social studies. She headed over there quickly to get a good back row seat. Crowds and crowds of kids were swarming around the hallways. All the faces she had seen in class were lost with the flow of kids running to their next class. She arrived and sprinted to the back. As she was getting settled, she noticed that mysterious girl was right next to her in the last seat. They both glanced at each other at the same time. They looked away in different directions. Then, suddenly, a loud booming voice said, Okay, class, partner up with the person next to you and discuss some of your favorite things. Lainey looked over and whispered, Hi, I'm Lainey, and you are? The girl looked over and said, I'm Marianne. Lainey decided to start a conversation by saying her favorite show, The Anoopies. Mary's Mary Ann's face changed to surprise. She said quietly, That's mine too. Lainey smiled. For some reason, Mary Ann seemed easy to talk to and really similar to her. They talked about their favorite things to do, and before she knew it, class was over. While walking out, Lainey realized that she might just have made her first friend. She couldn't believe it, and she couldn't wait to see her again. My name is Ari, and I'm going to be reading my poem, Sounds in Silence. I am silence. I am louder than you take me for. Without me, you would hear nothing. When you bask in silence, I roar in your ears. I can drive you insane. Sometimes you can see me in the outside world. When the rain pours, splattering and dropping, it seems to whisper silence. The clouds pour their hearts on the earth in the only way they know how. Only those who care to search for me find me. Some things just look so deafened because we lose track of them. I am the wind on the froth of the ocean at dawn. I am your body as you swim through a river, taking you forwards and back in the constant motion of the water. I am the closing of your eyes, the bathing of the sunlight on top of a mountain. I am the way you dream of everything you wish for in the future. 
I am the moonlight reflecting off of the forest floor. I am everything you never understood. I am the questions you cannot answer. Why? Because noise fills in enough. Because shouts, loud, beating, dish, rushing, winding, placing, all of these things are the loudness that fill your ears. Things that cannot fill our ears, our minds, our souls. These things sit in silence, unable to be answered, unable to be filled by anything, unable to fill. Silence is a secret, held tight to your chest, tight in the inner depths of yourself, the inner silences of a person. A soul is a world itself, and a secret is small, silhouetted by and shrouded in the hidden walls of your mind. Silence is the moon, looking down, down above with nothing to say, no words to speak. It is not completely darkened, but perhaps whispers ideas, floats little things down to us below. Hurled, mooned, velvet, silver, icy, cold silence. True Love by Ellie Shivington. A voice, no matter how angelic, when heard too much, can become tiresome. Noah thought this as a woman's vintage vocal cords crackled from the record player. Her mother's favorite record, Love Songs for Modern Women. The record, however, was recorded when the women of the 50s were modern. Something about them didn't sit right with Noah. Noah stared out the window of her parents' apartment, mindlessly searching for stars, while her thoughts were doing a curious dance in her mind. A familiar voice interrupted her thoughts. Darling, I need you to do me a favor. I meant to pick up my dark chocolate from DuPont's earlier today, but I forgot. Who? Noah's father piped in. Charles, Sarah, and their son, Robbie. Her mother sat down. She was a small woman, looking smaller in her soft pajamas. Her steely blue eyes looked at Noah with a mask of innocence. Whoever ends up with him will be one lucky girl. Noah gently corrected girl to woman in her head. She snatched her purple sweater, hustled down the stairs, and out into the drizzly night. Across the street was a hill that Noah had always seen but never gone to. She looked down at the bills folded up in her palm, debating. She ran down the slick roads and began the slippery ascent up the hill. The moon shone a bright white spotlight on her that reflected off the tiny mirrors that were falling from the sky and running down her face. The door to the apartment opened and Noah slapped a bar of dark chocolate triumphantly on the kitchen counter. Noah began peeling off her sweater as she walked upstairs. It worked. Her mother clapped her hands together in satisfaction. Noah walked through that door with a stupid smile on her face. That is the look of a girl in love. It was indeed the look of a woman in love. With the moon and the rain as company, she had realized why that record had been bugging her. The songs were about some man that somehow made her life complete, but always void of any recognition of self-worth. So, with a stupid smile in the pouring rain, she had discovered in herself a true love that would last a lifetime. My name is Olivia Wood, and I wrote The Swing of Things. The wet mulch squished satisfyingly under the little girl's shiny galoshes as she skipped through the empty playground, only one activity on her mind. Ahead of her sat an old swing set, its rusty metal frame glinting in the afternoon light. Landing onto one of the warm rubber seats with a plop, she sighed happily, kicking her suspended feet in the air. Pumping them back and forth, she rose higher into the sky and her, into her imagination with a joyful laugh. But it wasn't long until her legs were tired. Dragging them in the mulch as she passed to stop the swing, she soon slowed to a halt. Panting from the effort, she clutched the metal chains in her palms, turning the swing around absentmindedly. Once, twice, soon the two chains had intertwined into one above the girl's head. Leaning back in the narrow seat, she lifted her feet. At once the world blurred around her as the swing spun into motion. She watched her beloved town as it whirled by, noting the familiar presence of the looming clock tower, the busy grocers, the puddles drying on the sidewalks from yesterday's storm. She spurned in, turning in her seat to keep her eyes on the town. She cried out an alarm. The town had disappeared, replaced by rolling hills as far as I could see. The little girl blinked in surprise, craning her neck as the swing turned her around again. A settlement had appeared on the hills, horse-drawn wagons gathered in groups around small wooden cabins and campfires. Time seemed to slow the swing spin, girls' braids hovering midair. She resisted the urge to let go and rub her eyes, sighting houses where the wagons had been before.
People wandered about in their daily business, trading goods and harvesting wheat in the nearby fields. The girl gripped the chains with her sweaty palms and leaned forward, fascinated, but she couldn't watch for long, foiled again by the swing, which was jerking her around roughly as it untangled. She now smelled smoke. The next scene she witnessed was the light with an orange glow. For a time she knew it had returned, but it was burning. She shrieked in terror, watching helplessly as the clock tower lurched and crumbled into the hungry flames. Ashes traveled through the air, passing by her swing and choking her. She attempted to stop the odd vision, digging the toe of her shoe into the bulge, but it wasn't enough. The swing continued on. Yuku Hughes flipped the switch. I look around the attic, which ends up being an ugly, cramped, and threadbare existence, the sole exception being a light switch on the wall, sticking out from the pink insulation. I flick it up and down a couple times. It doesn't work, I know. You haven't wired it in, explained Mr. Barnes, a short, balding man who is my real estate agent. I raised an eyebrow. What kind of light switch needs to be wired in? It seems excessively difficult to get a little light around here. Mr. Burns rolled his eyes and flicked another switch, this one closer to the door, with the wire coming out of one of its sides. Um, an old light bulb flickered to the, in the middle of the ceiling. I blinked in surprise. What does the other switch control then? Mr. Barnes gave me an odd smile. It controls the sun itself. What? Once properly wired in, he explained, its position will decide whether the sun is turned on or off at the moment. That doesn't make sense, I protested. The sun isn't on or off because the night is just the phenomena when the earth is facing away from the sun. That's just because no one has turned off the sun, Barnes explained. If you flip the switch while it was properly wired in, the sun would just turn off. That doesn't even make sense, I protested. Mr. Barnes shrugged. In that case, we can just leave it the way it is. Can you at least wire it in for me? I asked. Well, I don't see why not, said Mr. Barnes as he pulled some copper wires out of the A fold in the insulation and took them around the bottom of the switch. I quickly flipped the switch to its off position. Nothing happened. I turned to Mr. Barnes and folded my arms. See? Nothing happened. Mr. Barnes looked rather panicked. It takes about eight minutes for light emitted by the sun to reach the earth. I guess we'll see what happens in eight minutes then, I said. I, uh, said Mr. Barnes. Let's go outside, I said. I want to see the sun turn off. Autumn Shaw, the name of my story, is coming home. The length of the deep space survey mission meant six years of cryosleep each way, in addition to the mission itself. Mallory told him she would understand if he couldn't wait for her, but he had. She had watched him age through the video messages he continued to send for each week of her sleep. She relished those images and his one-sided conversations during the many years of the mission's blackout communication. When she woke up the second time, Another six years later, his salt and pepper hair had made him look that much more distinguished. The crease above his left eyebrow had deepened to be that much more endearing. They stayed who they were in each other's eyes. He had stayed in this house, waiting for her, despite the drying landscape around him and their friends moving to the ever-dwindling greener lands and the places with more abundant water. She walked the hallway, passing the antique chinoiserie mirror, the Edo period wall panel, they had chosen together before leaving Japan. She could see the flickering light of the fire from the den, hear its crackle and pop. She imagined she felt its warmth already kissing her skin. She turned into the room, and there, sitting on the ratty brocade love seat, was an old man. There was no denying it. His skin was sallow and sagged, but his dimples were just the same, as was the crinkle above his left eyebrow, showing his intelligence, sense of humor, and affection. He stared back at her with the same sense of wonder she was sure she exhibited. Mallory? Jiro whispered as she turned into the room. Yes, it's me. I'm home. And before he could rise, she raced on still unsteady legs to throw herself beside him and into his open arms. This house was a vessel, as sure as her ship, the Georgiana, had been. It was in his arms that was home. Hi, it's your announcer again. 
I am honored to be able to read the third place winner in the adults, 18 and older category. The poem is Dragon Chant, and it was written by Edosa Omorui. Blood of my elders, forged by fire and steel, our tribe was born to rise, soaring beyond the limitations of our oppressors, escaping the mundane laws we once held as true. Poisoned by the lies that pinion our bodies to the soil like serpents slithering to find shelter, cursed by overwhelming power that slips through our grasp at every hint of discontent, we were born from kings, our history enriched with eyes toward the skies where our ancestors lie. We are salamanders no more. Lying dormant within the passion of a new generation, the Dragon Mother awaits our return to ascension as her flames will not be extinguished. She will return with riders from the heavens, painting the sky with a scarlet fury, reclaiming the pride left behind and the honor of the children burning deep inside. My name is Maddie Olby, and the title of my piece is Ouroboros. I was inspired to write this piece after doing some reading on the mythology of the Ouroboros. So here is my poem. The cold, watery murk floods my body, and because the river knows, it scrubs the sound from my ears, the voice from my throat, the light from behind my eyes. The silt scours the sunburn from my skin, and beneath I am soft and fearful. Then it tosses me, pink and fresh and shivering, into the gaping maw of midday sun, new but still the same, condemned to wander the barren bank alone, condemned to be my own hunger and to be my own sustenance. Knotted in a loop of acidic limbo, I burn off layers beneath the sun. Drowning and not drowning, drowning and waiting to drown, waiting and waiting to wait. Inside of that, I don't sleep much, but sometimes I dream that instead of peeling me apart piece by piece, the sun will light me on fire so that I can dance in a lick of flame until I feather into silver ash or blur into hazy smoke. The river sees my dreams and knows when I've drifted too far, when I need to be reminded. That's when it comes, full and rushing and relentless, and I stop breathing just as. Nancy Collander, Full Watch. At last, the owner and her friends were gone. Now the mayor and I could get down to the business at hand. It was 12.30 and the mayor was restless. I knew she would drop it tonight. Outside, I watched the taillights fade and quiet and darkness enveloped me. I stood for a moment and took it all in, breathing deeply of the night air. A full moon rode high above the barn and the cloudless sky revealed swirls of stars. Bats whispered on black velvet wings. Back inside, I took up my waiting on two straw bales outside the foaling stall. I knew I would not really sleep. Foaling affected me the same way each time, beginning with anticipation, then breathless mystery, and finally, exhilaration. Even without sleep, I would not be tired in the morning. The mare moved heavily around her stall, waiting for the time to arrive. Hanging her head over the wall, our eyes met in understanding and trust. We had been through this many times before. We were troopers. A barn in the deep of night is a magical place. Time spun out in the soft, rustling darkness and a mouse scurried somewhere behind the wall. Later, the old lazy barn cat curled up next to me on the straw to keep the quiet watch. I dozed. With a sudden rush, the water broke and I came awake immediately. Groaning softly, the mare went down and I moved to the stall door, opening it a few inches. She would not need help but I would give what support I could just being nearby. Awe overtook me, as it always did. <laughs> 